Good morning, and welcome to our digital program with Rahm Emanuel on Cities in the Age of Pandemics. I'm Evo Dalder, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and thank you all so much for joining us today via Zoom. With the health and well-being of our community uppermost in mind, the Council has made the decision to cancel all in-person public events through at least June 5th. Accordingly, we're uh, sad to announce uh, that we have canceled the 2020 Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. Of course, we remain committed to continuing to develop compelling and timely Global Cities content throughout the year, and that includes today's program. Despite the challenging times that we all face, uh, the Council continues to engage with our members and with the public uh, uh, throughout this time. Please check our website, the, the Chicago dot, uh, the Chicago Council org for upcoming programs and information how you can help and support the organization. As always, our council programs offer you the opportunity to participate. If you want to ask a question or vote on one, please point your browser to ccga.live and towards the end of our 45 minutes here, I will go and take your questions uh, and we'll have that as part of our conversation. Today's program is on cities in the age of pandemics from canceling gatherings to enforcing shelter-in-place orders, announcing relief packages, cities around the world are on the front line of responding to COVID-19. As in any crisis, cities are implementing their own responses to this global pandemic while balancing both national and state directives. Joining us today to share his insight on the challenges facing cities in the age of pandemics is Ram Emanuel, who served as mayor of Chicago from 2011 to 2019. Before that, he was President Obama's Chief of Staff, he was a Senior Advisor to President Clinton, and he was a three-term Congressman from the 5th Congressional District uh, of Illinois. Fittingly for our discussion, Mayor Emanuel has just published an important new book called The Nation City, Why Mayors Are Now Running the World. Welcome, Mayor Emanuel. Wonderful to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Evo. And I want to thank everybody uh, for joining and obviously wish everybody uh, getting through this period of time to being safe as well as uh, careful with their uh, family. So just speaking about family, how are you doing? Uh, and your family, everybody uh, adjusting to this new reality that we're <laughs> the, the, the girls are living large. <laughs> They're doing college online this, yeah, with a couple of friends. I'm not sure how much learning's going on, but they're doing, no, it's everybody's good. Uh, we're lucky and we're fortunate. Good, when great. You get everything that's going around in the world, everything that's happening, we're very fortunate. Yeah, no, we, we, we do have that uh, ability that we can continue to do what we do uh, in an online environment in a way that so many of our fellow citizens and yeah. the world cannot. Um, let, me, let me go back because you've, you, this is not the first time you're dealing with a big pandemic. As a government, in, today you're not a government official, but before right. you, um, uh, people, in, when there is a pandemic, we look to the national government. We look right. to help, have them figure out how to help and guide us. You were chief of staff and President Obama uh, back in 2009 when uh, we experienced the last time we had one of these uh, events, the H1N1 uh, flu. What did you learn from that crisis? Well, let me take a, a couple steps uh, back. And the reason is I think one of the lessons that's going to have to, and I look at this and again, we're right in the middle of it. So it's hard to do kind of a, uh, an anatomy, a study of what happened wrong, et cetera. But every four years, if you really go back after the last 20 years, we have had some form of an international virus, flu, et cetera. You go H1N1, you go SARS, you go MERS, you go the swine flu, you go Ebola, this. The truth in, when I think about it, the systems, because not, not, neither one of them was a crisis that threw either the public health system or the economy or both off whack. We actually, I think, as a country, a society, an economy, and our government and our public health and our health care system all got our guard down. We got acclimated that we would face one of these, but it would never become what this has been, which is crippling. And, uh, you know, that famous quote by Winston Churchill, when the tide goes out, you find out who's not, who's been swimming without their shorts. We've been swimming without our shorts when it relates to our public health system. I actually think one of the lessons coming out of this is going to be, that there's going to be stimulus too is going to be this massive infrastructure investment in CDC, FDA, in uh, obviously NIH, in FEMA. Because while one of the things I note in my book is that while you have this dysfunction at the national level, 
cities are stepping up doing more and more, but we all need a national government for a national response to a national crisis. You can't, there's no alternative to the national government, and there's also no alternative at the local level for national leadership. It will fill a void, but it can't create and dominate that space at the very level. And I do think uh, going forward, you're going to see a whole review of supply chain. You're going to see a whole review of how we deal with public health professionals and being able to surge. You know, we do this unbelievably well internationally. There's a tsunami. There's a major earthquake. The United States comes in and creates mobile host hospitals. But we're going to have to start doing everything we've done around the world as a good world leader. We're going to have to start doing here at home and turn inwards in developing that skill, taking that skill set and translating it here at home. And I think this is going to be uh, like another five-year process of how we upgrade our capacity. And one analogy I use, if you remember Hurricane Andrews in 1992, President Bush did a, not a very good job, like uh, his son and Katrina, in response. The response from FEMA was the response post-Andrew wasn't to get rid of FEMA. Actually, President Clinton elevated FEMA to a cabinet level, put James Lee Witt in place, a real capable person, and we set the gold standard of when there's a national weather event like crisis in America, how we respond. My view is post this, the answer is not going to be to get rid of the CDC. The answer is going to be how do you put the CDC on steroids? The answer isn't to get rid of the FDA or the NIH. It's how to make sure they have the funding, the resources, and the personnel capable of running a great public health uh, entity. That's what I think will be the lesson out of this. So let's step back for a minute because I think those are, those are big. Uh, <laughs> I just uh, threw like five uh, bowling balls down the road. Right? Yeah, no, those, those are, and, and, they, and they all make sense. And I, and I think the Andrew FEMA uh, example is a very good one. We learned how professionalism uh, at, the, in, at FEMA was really critical uh, for success and, exactly. and the lessons that President Clinton took from that. You can really fail politically if you don't take care of these issues. And, and uh, FEMA and Jamie Lee Witt were, were key responses to that. Mm -hmm. in, in, in this crisis, as in a natural disaster, but in this even more than almost any other crisis we face, there is this intersection between what the national government needs to do, because it is the only one that can make set priorities and deliver right. uh, in, in a way, and the reality that all responses are in fact local that much of what happens on the day-to-day -day basis happens in on our streets, uh, which hopefully are more empty, ha happens in the economic engine that is, uh, that is in our cities, and it happens in our hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, all of whom are de decentralized authorities. We have municipal authorities and county authorities and state authorities uh, over, over health and not really uh, so much a national uh, uh, health uh, issue. So, Go, go back to your experience from 09, and then we can talk about okay. uh, later. Sort of, you are now in the White House. You, you're centrally involved. This is a crisis where you have to start thinking about what do we do nationally, and how do we work together with our local governments? How did you so, experience that, and what do you guys do? Well, first of all, like, let's, let me take a moment relevant and play, play it right now, real time. Uh, so back in uh, 09, in the first month, we were doing three things simultaneously, and one of them I think is very, very relevant here. Uh, we obviously, the TARP had passed, the financial stabilization account for the uh, financial institutions had passed, but we hadn't figured out how to use it. So that's what Tim Geithner, Larry Summers, Austin Goolsby were all trying to figure out, does it go to debt, does it go to equity? How do you create the floor? We passed a stimulus uh, bill in that window, while we were figuring out the bank piece, February 24th, about five weeks after the president uh, got sworn in, he gives a major address to the country, a joint session, not a State of the Union, where he's announced, we'll do whatever it takes, because at that time, there were a lot of people thinking that we needed more than the original $700 billion. So he didn't announce a number, but he gave the confidence to the market that we're ready, we're locked and loaded if we need to be. Two. Right after the stimulus bill passed, and I had been with Phil Shalero locked up in Harry Reid's office to get the three to four votes that we needed, both from the three Republicans, our inspector, Susan Collins, Olympia Snow. The vice president, the president, myself, Ron Klain, the vice president's chief of staff met, 
And, you know, I said one of the big problems is because this was third was state aid, a third was taxes and a third was investment. Like your whole healthcare IT came out of that stimulus bill. The entire alternative energy or renewable energy came out of that stimulus bill. And we said you can't allow the government mentality of a year long appropriation to be adopted if we're going to be get the money out fast and furious effort. That's where the notion of the vice president overseeing the implementation of the stimulus bill came. It was from that meeting in the Oval Office. And so Congress is passing this bill today. Like who in this administration is going to be in charge of making sure that in the next 30 days, not the next six months, this money is out. And that is a, you know, if you, and I, I apologize for the partisanship of this comment that's about to happen, but if you thought of an administration that couldn't deliver a test, the notion that you're going to move $2 trillion that fast and furious is the operative term here. Because, you know, the mindset of a Department of Appropriations, or rather Department of Transportation is send us your application. We'll review it, see if you get the, you know, stage two. That's not going to work here. So they need literally a czar that puts the entire cabinet on a short leash. You'll have to report 15 days, 30 days, 40 days, 45 days, 50 days, how much of this is moving because speed is more important than accuracy right now because this is a transfer payment. That's number two. Number three, in the transition, I'm moving timelines here. Uh, President Obama asked me to go meet with uh, President Bush and Josh Bolton. We're in the transition period. And I told him, look, we're going to pass a stimulus bill. We're going to interpret the um, financial TARP stabilization. We need some breathing room on the auto. I mean, we can't handle this. So President Bush, to his credit, you know, he's in the waning days. There's President-elect Obama. He's still the president. He agreed to take the political issue of tapping the TARP, the financial aid that was meant for the financial industry, and use $26 billion to give Ford, rather Chrysler and GM, a lifeline, which would give us, A, the ability to deal with the other two parts of the economy, and B, the political issue of tapping the financial aid, but use it for the auto industry, that political issue would be off the table, and C, it would allow us to set up the, at that point, the, uh, the assistance for the auto industry, the task force. And what I would say operative now to this administration, you cannot play um, President Trump's denial and delay. Fast and furious have got to be your modus operandi. And it has to, to put a stop on the sp spiraling of the economy down and a stop on the spiraling of the healthcare system breakdown. That has to be the, uh, getting it right uh, is not the term. Getting fast and overwhelming force is the operative uh, uh, North Star here. So w without necessarily getting into a, a, a deep assessment of, uh, of how the current administration has dealt with these things, the reality is, is that- Oh, I was hoping we did that, Evo. I, was, yeah. I would enjoy that. No. I, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> and I've been happy for you to, to, uh, to pontificate on it, but <laughs> I'll do it in, in the following way, which is to say that, you know, in the meantime, uh, the city of New York, uh, perhaps the city of Chicago, and others are faced with this extraordinary crisis that they can't deal with themselves, mm -hmm. uh, all of them by themselves. And there is no coordinating mechanism. There, I mean, the, the, the administration decided it's not going to be the coordinating uh, a, a body that is going to do that. Mayors are running the world. Uh, I think that's the subtitle of, uh, of your book. Mm -hmm. As a mayor, uh, how does a Bill de Blasio working at, and a Lori Lightfoot and, and, and a Garcetti working presumably with their governance, which they have done in, in most instances extremely well. Uh, Correct. How do they deal with this issue? How do they get the federal government uh, the focus that they need on the health side? On the economic side, it's a little different because the entities actually that are going to be responding are different. They're the businesses and, and others, although of course, governance. So here, yeah, but on the health side. Well, here's what I would, uh, there's two parts to this, and let me try to analyze it because I do think the economy is a piece of it because no, no society can take another four months of not existing. That's a, so one of the principles of the public health side is separation and segregation. 
On the other hand, the economy and society live by integration and dependency. Those two principles are in conflict. And at some point, you're going to have to remove the conflict and get to co uh, cooperation between those two not uh, adjacent uh, bodies of thought, which is separation versus integration. I do think on the public health side, you have two things, one today, one tomorrow. We're basically approaching this everybody, which is the right way. And the reason we're doing everybody is because we lost valuable time in developing a test so we can do what South Korea did, which is deal with seniors first, Group B is people with immune system de de deficits that they have, you know, and then, then C and D are different parts of the population. Apply the testing to the most vulnerable population, separate those people uh, out of society so that you could deal, the healthcare system could set up. One, the testing, two, this uh, healthcare system. And I think every city has got to start and get the capacity. And you really do need, there's no replacement here. You need the federal government to say, okay, here's the testing, here's how we're going to measure it. That looks like it is ramping up uh, uh, fast. On the other hand, it's still slower than the spread of the disease. So that's number one. Number two, how do I then build up my public health system so both the hospitals, the professionals there, meaning the nurses and nurse assistants, the doctors, have the support they need. I saw one interesting article take everybody who's in their last six months of medical training, nurses, doc, get them into the health profession. That's about 150,000 more people, but that's 150,000 more than we have today because people are already at near exhaustion level. And what we also saw, and one side note, our systems were being overwhelmed by the seasonal flu and then you threw on this pandemic. And then third, which is looking a little around the corner on this. So you get the testing in, you get the healthcare systems, the equipment, and the federal government has to be the clearinghouse. J.B. Pritzker and Lori Lightfoot and Cuomo and Newsom and their respective mayors cannot be bidding against each other in a black market where everybody's bidding up prices of 800% north. You just can't. And the federal government is the only person that can set a national standard of which this is, here's how we're going to do it, and here's how we're going to distribute it. Third, I do think one of the next things, and this gets you, uh, they have to get ahead of. If you have a desire to start getting parts of society back to normal, parts, not the society, we cannot deal with this in broad strokes. You're going to have to get the testing system, which there's money in the stimulus bill for, which is for how do you test and say, look, I got the, uh, I got, uh, the virus, but I'm now healthy, and so you have an immune system. So there's some way of showing you can get on a plane, you can go to a restaurant, you can start actually integrating yourself back into the economy and society. And so I would prioritize the healthcare system, prioritize the sea legs under the public health, make sure there's enough beds, make sure there's enough equipment. The governor, the mayor's coordinating in that effort, and they've done well, but they need the federal government so they're not bidding against each other. And then two, this uh, thinking through on the integration part that's much better than what we did in the crisis part. Uh, while we're still in a crisis, what I mean by integration is getting parts of the economy because you can't last like this three months. It's not going to work. And they have to come to terms with a more thoughtful approach. I don't know, thoughtful is not the right word, strategic, because I think up front, when we lost so much time, we did things that, uh, in retrospect, were not uh, the right thing, not just the testing, et cetera. I mean, one could argue sending kids home from college was exactly the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I think, I mean, part, part of the problem, that, of course, that, that those leaders, and in this case, you're talking about university presidents, is they had right. no guidance. They had no idea. They had I'm to. Not, I'm, I'm not right. critical. I, but, 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 in retrospect. But I think, I think the, the, the reality is, right, they're not going to get guidance on the reintegration either. And, and so, uh, so the question, uh, it seems to me that, that two out of the three steps that you just listed, the one, uh, uh, one where I think the federal government has to lead is on this procurement issue in order to make sure that nobody is, is bidding against each other. But on the uh, getting the health system up and running is a, still a state slash local responsibility. Uh, and so the coordination there 
uh, well, that, yes, yes and no. Innovation evil. can take place, right? And yes and no. I mean, I look. You have to have a situation. Look, uh, you can declare a national emergency for New York, and the federal government comes in. But you know, our national guard, and I don't mean our when I say our Illinois, but that's true of all fifty states. They get sent around the world setting up house, hospitals, mobile hospital units. Okay, let me give you another example. You go back to 1980, we, or 1990, we had an amazing amount of hospitals uh, that have now consolidated, closed. Re retrofitting an old hospital is a lot easier than setting up a whole new hospital. Uh, and the, so you have the bed capacity and then the uh, equipment capacity from masks to ventilators at all, and then the protective gear. And then you have the people Etc. And you got to go. There's no shortchanging this. A state can set up through this National Guard, the mobile units. You could start retrofitting some of the old hospitals uh, and opening them. And then you have, have to get the equipment where the federal government is providing Illinois the type of equipment it's going to need to provide the public health uh, services that the public are going to need. There's no and. And while I said mayors are running more of the world, it's because of the dysfunction. I also said in the book, there's no replacement to the federal government on any one of these challenges. You would prefer a federal partner. And we're going to find out that the federal government, uh, and I use, you know, we talked about earlier Hurricane Andrew. Because of Hurricane, because of what happened with Katrina, when we faced the BP fiasco in the Gulf, we had a real FEMA, a real operation to actually deal with that. I think the post on this is there is no replacement to the federal government in a national crisis. You can improvise, you can be creative. The federal government has to step in. So New York, Illinois, California, you don't have 50 different models and let alone bidding against each other for the same material to save the lives of our fellow citizens. Let me uh, uh, let me focus a little bit on Chicago. Of course, a city you know uh, extremely well. Does Chicago have unique challenges to deal with this issue? Does it have unique advantages? It's certainly not as dense, for example, as New York, which, which clearly is an, is an advantage. But if you look at Chicago, and and without getting into the specifics of how we've dealt with this issue, but what right. is how, how does how does Chicago stand in its ability to deal with a crisis like this? What are what are some of the really big challenges it has because of the reality that that we face, and what are some of the opportunities that you can see? Well, one of the things. Let me give you an example of, uh, and there will be a post mortem, and I've already started to myself think. But go back uh, twenty plus years, nineteen ninety five. We have a major heat wave. Seven hundred plus senior citizens die. Because, you know, the fire department went this way, the police department went that way, public health went this way. It was not. The OEMC, the Office of Emergency Management Control, is the state of the art in the United States of America. When the NATO conference was held here in 2012, the federal government came in, NATO, they said, that we've never seen anything like this. And that was a postmortem of, okay, thank God we have the OEMC. Uh, post that area. And I would say that coordinating effort with the amount of uh, information centralized and the ability to bring all, not only public agencies, but central private agencies that provide services like utilities, et cetera, and hospitals, really, really important. Big strength. Two, I happen to, ha I do believe this, you know, as you close streets, et cetera, given our central business district, et cetera, Allowing that for pedestrian traffic, whatever city you're in, big strength for the city. Uh, third, we have a tremendous healthcare system. And actually, bizarrely, two separate ones. So you have the Illinois Medical District on the west side, and then the Medical District in Streeterville. So you're not concentrating all the healthcare singularly, having kind of almost replicable. Uh, back, and I wouldn't say one is a backup to the other, but two different uh, places of location, really strong. The ability to move, because we have multiple children's hospitals, all the children to one area, opening up other beds for ICU, et cetera, big strength. And then the other thing is uh, research that's adjacent to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about Rush Presbyterian, 
University of Illinois uh, Circle, UIC, plus you have the research facility right there. So your ability to test, get lab, get results, proximity, again, a, in normal times, a real strength. I think those are strengths. Uh, here's a, we a weakness, and I'll guarantee that this will go into the next stimulus bill. The idea that certain kids can learn online and other kids cannot, there will be universal broadband and the hardware to go with that wiring. Um, because life's going to change for all of us, but it cannot change where some people can succeed at that life and other people are going to be held back because of technology and equity. Uh, and I, uh, I will bet there's a stimulus bill coming. And in that stimulus bill, there'll be infrastructure, meaning, uh, and part of that will not only be roads and bridges, but broadband, things that we've learned that are really, we've talked about for years, that crisis will get solved in this way. So there's strengths to the city. And then I would say one thing that is really, I've seen, you know, I saw it when we had Chiberia and weather and et cetera. The character of the people of Chicago to take care of each other, to check on neighbors. I have seen incredible, just in my neighborhood and around, incredible stories of the generosity of soul to make sure that no family goes without food or goes without support. Uh, our sense of even when we're a city with a north side, a northwest side, a south side, a southwest side, a west side, a near west side, our sense of community and the culture of community uh, is the strength of this city that doesn't get replicated in every other city. And that's a real strength is the character of the people. Uh, that's that's uh, certainly true. We see it every day, uh, almost everywhere, that uh, the people of Chicago are ready to we're ready to step up and are stepping up in ways that one would hope and in, in fact is happening. So that's, that's, that's great. Let me, let me, uh, I'm going to go to uh, some of the questions that are being asked online. Sure. And the big one uh, is what everybody is, is thinking about. We're, we're seeing what's happening in New York city. Uh, it is uh, the epicenter now uh, of the, of the disease. Do you think uh, uh, it, at least a pandemic here in the United States at the moment, uh, do you think that Chicago is just a couple of weeks behind? Or how do you see, and, and if so, how do we prepare for this? What is it that we do now uh, to deal with uh, a New York uh, two or three year, uh, weeks from now? Look, I don't mean to play, uh, you know, doctor, as I used to tell my, you know, my parents have a doctor in the family. I'm a spin doctor, so no, but on a serious note. You do have a doctor in the family. Yeah, so you yeah. we don't listen to him. His okay. bedside manners are horrible. Uh, no, and here's one thing I just saw today in the paper. So when I look at the data, I always, you got to not look at the raw data. You got to look at like New York's rate of growth is uh, tapering off. That's the first sign that some of the policies put in place are beginning to have the impact that you want to see. We don't, we have density in different parts of the city, not like New York that has density throughout. So it's not a perfect, my analysis is, there are other, there's parts of the city that have immense density that's replicable to, uh, that lessons out of New York are gonna be valuable. And there's parts of the city that do, do not have that uh, challenge and that's gonna be an, uh, an asset, not a liability. Um, I don't think we're where New York is like it is today. I do think, uh, regardless of that, we have major challenges that we have to make sure that we're totally focused on like a laser as it relates to healthcare capacity and infrastructure. Um, uh, so I think we have, uh, we have to look at New York and say, okay, therefore the grace of God goes I unless we do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I think that's uh, happening uh, in, you know, fits and starts, but it's happening uh, in that. So I do think though, one thing we should note is the pace is beginning to, uh, the nose, so to say, is coming down. And that means the, so, the physical distancing, the separation, the, isol the isolation away from big gatherings has, is beginning to have the type of um, effect you want to see on the spread of this virus. So, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, we, we want to bend that curve as much as we yeah. can, and as quickly as but we can. But you know, here's the thing again, it's the second question. You want to bend the curve, but only to buy you time uh, to do certain things. If you don't use that time, it's not going to be a net positive. So, and again, I'm, I'm going to avoid from being partisan, 
the president was right to put a stop on travel from China. He was right. He, what was wrong was not using that to then say, okay, where are we on our ventilators? Where are we on our masks? Where are we on the getting FD, CDC to say, here's how we're going to test. Here's how you're going to get the results back, et cetera. That we lost the time that that, embar not embargo, but that prevention of any travel between China and the United States should have been used for. So what I would say here in Chicago, you know, the social distancing, and this is true about New York, it's true about LA, Atlanta, whatever city you want to use, that is working. But what we're trying to do is use that time, and this is where governors and mayors are being uh, leaders, is we're using that time, not saying these numbers aren't true, not saying that um, I don't want to know this, is how do you use that time to not just bend the curve, but stand up your entire public health system? Because it's coming, whether it's coming in wave one or two, that then you can both meet the public health need without being overwhelmed and then have a further public health crisis. Yeah, which is the key, exactly. Uh, uh, how do you think uh, Chicago has, uh, up to this point, uh, been able to prepare and anticipate for a pandemic like this and actually put it into, in, into action? I mean, the cities, the, the cities acted very quickly. I think that the governors acted very quickly. How much of that was uh, preparation? How much was it being ready to understand that something like this was coming? Well, I think that... Uh Look, I, I don't want to, I'm trying to avoid, uh, as you know, I have a practice. I never said anything about my predecessor. I don't have a successor. There are certain things, look, the gut, you know, the person's running emer emergency management for the state was somebody that ran uh, OEMC, the o Office of Emergency Management for the city of Chicago. Uh, Alicia is a three-star uh, general, adjunct general. When the nation faced a problem in Flint, Michigan, the federal government sent her in to do it. So I think in responding, distribution of resources, I happen to know certain personnel, I think we've been very, very good and ahead of the curve. And here's a lesson for everybody that says, oh, public health and public service. You know, telling everybody you have to stay in house, not go out, etc. not exactly what a popular position. That's not usually what public service want to do. And to the governors have been really forthright uh, with the public taking unpopular positions, it does show you, A, the public is willing to t do tough and difficult things, one, because you have a crisis, and two, because they're being, they're being dealt with honestly. I think what needs to happen and continue to happen is, here's what we're facing, here's what we're trying to do in this time, here's the time frame we think this will be about, we don't know, but if you tell people and give them a mental map, and tell them the steps you're taking. Uh, you can be very, uh, obviously do the difficult things you need to do to get ready and manage through a process. That same thing has to happen with a, what I call, we're about to enter stage two, that kind of integrated of approach between society, the economy, and the public health needs of, whether it's the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, or the United States of America. Do you see this as an opportunity for mayors to uh, connect to each other, and, to, and 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 not only not only nationally but internationally? Uh, you know, city of Madrid is dealing with a crisis in a way that uh, that looks like New York. Um, yeah. How would you you know if you were sitting? Uh, I know we don't we don't want to talk about uh, about about current mayors, but just as a mayor, uh, and and having taken the steps here, uh, what are the resources that you look for beyond the federal government? Uh, and, and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, you know, one of the things, I don't want to, you know, if you want to read the book, great. If you want to buy it, great. If not, uh, but one of the things I talked about was... On both. Idea, uh, yeah. Perfect. Ideas used to move around and then move up vertically. Ideas now over the last 10 years, and it's going to be true for the next, as far as the eye can see, ideas move horizontally. Cities learn from each other. And because of technology like this, they learn now in real time. The idea that you're going to go to six months from now, you're going to go to a conference and look at that's going to still happen. But the fact is, everybody's looking at take a look at South Korea. I now know more about how South Korea's public health system works, how it focused on which set of populations, et cetera, and how they by their testing uh, and concentration and being very tailored and strategic were allowed it not to become a massive public health crisis that destabilized the rest of society. 
And I, but again, I want to use this as an example. South Korea in 2015 failed with SARS. Why they're succeeding today is they took this, studied it, and said, okay, what did we do wrong, and how do we make sure? And the reason they're better prepared today is because they did the hard work after 2015. And may, you know, if you look at how Seoul co concentrated or cooperated rather with the national government, how Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore focused, I think those are lessons that not only wait for another time, that you could, you could put in place right today uh, and do it in real time because today technology provides that lesson. And mayors are all looking at each other, finding out what worked, what didn't work, Here's how I did this, the conversion of uh, facilities into hospital beds, the conversion of facilities into distribution centers, logistic centers, that has a real capacity. It actually made me think about something you said, what's the strength of Chicago? Um, I think supply chain and logistics are gonna come out of this with a whole new interpretation. Chicago happens to be the capital of third party logistics firms, independent firms. And I think there's going to be a whole reanalysis, not only the supply chain, but the logistics X work. And Chicago has a huge intellectual operational strength. One of the reasons not is because of geography. We're in the center of the country. It was a system built up over years. That um, intellectual strength, corporate strength, uh, entrepreneurial strength is a real asset going forward that as not only drew here today, but it's going to be becoming an ever increasing strength for the city of Chicago going forward. We're uh, we're getting to the end of our uh, conversation, which I've, uh, I've greatly. I was just getting started. Well, you know, we can we can do it again. We'll do it once a week, right? <laughs> Not a problem. Um, you said in 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 two thousand and eight, memorably, that you never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and we've already talked a little bit about. About, about what steps you can do. But if you, if you look at the issue of how do you build up resilience for, for a city, which is really the key is you, you can't prevent these things. You need to survive them. Uh, what, uh, what do you see as sort of the big, big uh, opportunities that come out of this crisis uh, that will make us a better, stronger city, state, country, and ultimately, because it's a global crisis, uh, a world. What do you? What do you? Where do you see the opportunities lie uh, mm. that didn't exist before? I and mean, your de definition, which is an important one, of never let a crisis go to waste, is that there are now opportunities that you didn't think you could actually seize or didn't want to uh, uh, didn't want to go after. We're now able to do that. What do you see some of us as the final well, point? Well, so let me give two two lessons out of our uh, public. Um, I told. Uh, I mean, I gave an example of the heat wave that created OEMC. I was a congressman also dealt with the flooding that was up in the north uh, in the Albany Park community and surrounding neighborhoods. It was happening with a frequency. We ended up, I said, that's it. Everything we've done has not worked. We built a deep tunnel. To date, at least, even with high water, we haven't had that flooding. So the question is, what kind of investments come from this uh, going forward? And I think... We started uh, with the, uh, I think it was the Rockefeller Foundation, a resiliency study for the city of Chicago, a resilient officer in the mayor's office. I would ex take that whole pr approach now and say, okay, when we get through this, what is the post-mortem? What gets built? What gets added to? What gets set up? How do you have a resilience? That was thought of from kind of climate change. Mm -hmm. I have a, my own view, and I, Chicago, the United States of America, you, one thing I'm going to guarantee, there will be another pandemic. Last 20 years, we had five. How do you ensure that the next pandemic doesn't lead to the same economic dislocation? That means not only the public health piece, the people piece, the infrastructure piece, that when that happens, not every pandemic can be a depression. And I think studying on a Chicago level, your resiliency study, so there's equity, fairness, not just community uh, charity, so to say, but that the public sector is set up to actually make sure that society can keep going while it manages a public health challenge. And I think that study uh, will be done. It's been done in other pieces. The country has to do it. 
That's what CAP and that's how we, you know, Homeland Security Department, the Department of Nas uh, National Intelligence, DNI, were outgrowths of post 9 11. Then systems were set up to analyze cities based on threat level for, for terrorism. We're going to have to take this and study city by city, state by state, and demand blueprint plans for how you not just deal with the coronavirus, but future events that will happen because of climate change. It's coming. And so the question is, how do you then make sure your city and all populations have a resiliency level that they can take the kind of, I don't, maybe this is not the right language, but the body blow without being knocked down. And that work will be done and then the investments will have to happen. Here is my one prediction. We've lived with an era of government is the problem and that the private sector is an incredible success. I think you're going to find out that the true, out of this, the true public-private partnership is there are things the private sector does really well at, but it's also not built for. And there are things that you can only handle with a robust, strong public sector. And it's not an either or choice. And I think we're going to find out post going forward in this crisis, what is the things that the public sector does really well at and needs to do? And then what are the things that the private sector can't do, but needs the public sector to do? And what are the things that the private sector can do? They can accelerate real great research on a quick time like that uh, in a way. And that's a strength of this country. It's a strength of our city. But you need the public sector to guide that and create demand that doesn't exist just in the marketplace. And that to me is a reinterpretation because we've now, I'll end where I started. The tide went out and we're not wearing any shorts. And that the richest country in the world may have the best healthcare system in the world, but our public health has been starved and that shows at every level. Yeah, I think that's uh, clearly one of the big lessons that we're all learning. And, and actually, because it is a global crisis, we see it in real time. Those countries where the public health sector, in fact, is strong and capable. And in South Korea, I think, is, is one of those examples. And Singapore, uh, as another example, they're more resilient uh, in the face of the crisis that's uh, been remarkable, even though private industry was really important, even in South Korea, to get those tests done, et cetera. So it's that. Look, they got extra hospital beds from the private sector. I mean, here's what I would say. You have to have an investment strategy that invests forward. And we're gonna need to adopt that investment strategy, not just on the public health side, on the broadband side, on the kind of infrastructure side going forward. There's gonna be a whole things that come from this, but the main thing is to make sure that not every challenge or crisis becomes a destabilizer to society and the economy as a whole. And I think we're gonna have to find that approach going forward in a more integrative fashion uh, uh, than we are today, which is as you appropriately clamp down the segregation, the separation of the public health side, it destabilized the integration and dependency model of the economy. And that has to get more complementary than contradictory going forward. Mayor Manuel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been terrific, uh, wonderful uh, uh, conversation here. Uh, thank you all for uh, everyone else for joining us for your questions. A recording of this program will be available on the council website, uh, our YouTube channel, and on our social media platform shortly. Thank you all for being part of this, uh, Mayor Manuel. Be safe. Uh, you too. You and your family and everyone else, and uh, uh, hope to be able to do this in person sooner rather than later the next time around. Thank you for joining us and thank you. Take all care. Bye bye.